I'm always thinking about that sort of forward curve for, for metal prices on an upper trajectory, which is the opposite of the entire street, by the way, is, is a deflation for metal prices. And so this is an important chart because imagine, imagine if I'm right and they do have to cut interest rates because labor markets had issues and so forth. You know, what would that do to gold? And I think actually silver can do quite well for those that will tell me, hey, you know, look at silver. How did it do in, in the global financial crisis? It crashed. Yes. And how did it do in the 1970s when we had declines of the equity markets? Actually, silver went up. And the reason for that is because we were in a stagflationary environment, which I think it's much more likely than what we saw back in 08 in other periods. Metals marked a generally positive second quarter. Analysts at Deutsche Bank said in a note dated Monday, the total return for silver's spot price was at 16.7% for the period, while copper's was at 9.6%, with both posting their strongest quarterly total return performances in six quarters, Deutsche Bank said. Meanwhile, gold's 4.3% return in the second quarter was its third straight quarterly gain. Tavi Costa, partner and portfolio manager at Crescat Capital, delves into the thought experiment during his interview, reflecting on the dramatic shifts in market expectations over recent years. Costa emphasizes a bright future for precious metals following economic uncertainties, historical resilience, and current market dynamics as supportive factors for potential price appreciation. Gold prices rose on Wednesday, as the latest speech from Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell fed hopes that the next interest rate move would be cut, even if the timing remains uncertain. Despite economic shifts, Tavi Costa views silver's recent breakout as a sign of oversold conditions, signaling potential gains ahead. His forward-looking approach in financial modeling underscores optimism for silver's trajectory, contrasting with prevailing deflationary forecasts in the market. A global supply deficit and bets on rising demand for silver helped the metal outpace the gains in gold, copper, and other financial assets in the second quarter, analysts said on Monday. And further gains in prices for the white metal look likely, analysts said on Monday. Concurrently, Costa is optimistic about the overall performance of silver based on its past performances, such as in the stagflationary periods in the 1970s. Now, we present the clips of Tavi Costa's insights from his recent interview. Before we continue to delve into this discussion, please subscribe to our channel and activate the bell icon for timely updates. The thought exercise is always to go back to, it was an interview with Stanley Druckmiller in which he claims, if I had an analyst, you know, go to the Mars uh, and essentially, you know, bring him back to Earth, uh, after, you know, whatever, six months, tell him not to look at the prices of assets in general and give him the the changes that we're, we've seen in the last six months and tell them, what would you expect the behavior of the, each of these assets to be? And if I tell you that we're going to go, that the whole market would go from, we're going to see seven, eight you know, rate cuts. And if you look back, I mean, if we're those estimates were seven rate cuts, but some other folks were estimating 10 cuts, you know, the crazy things. Uh, and, and during that time, and I'm referring to that beginning of, of the year or end of the year uh, in, in 2023. Now, since then, we've seen this shift, right, where uh, rate cuts have been basically being priced out of the market, essentially. To me, that's one of the most hawkish changes in market expectation that we've probably seen in the last 30 years. I don't remember seeing... 500 basis points being shifted from one side to another. In fact, it was 600 basis points not too long ago. So how in the world we're going to see that tightening movement? And at the same time, silver will do well. You know, and that, to me, that, that's, that's, you know, that's basically the strength of the positioning of the metal. It's basically what reflects. And if you ask me, I think this is the beginning of a really – a special period for for silver and I, I believe that not only we saw that breakout now we're literally oversold at thirty dollars an ounce now it wouldn't surprise me if we we're trading at 40 50 dollars an ounce uh not not to uh in the near future and so uh, please don't quote me on that but I, I do think that that's that's a possibility that's my mindset when i'm you know applying uh, mo financial modeling for a business i'm always thinking about that a sort of you know, forward curve for, for metal prices on an upper trajectory, which is the opposite of the entire street, by the way, is, is a deflation for metal prices. And so this is an important chart because imagine if they do have to cut, imagine if I'm right and they do have to cut interest rates because labor markets had issues and so forth. 
you know, what would that do to gold? And I think actually silver can do quite well. For those that will tell me, hey, you know, look at silver. How did it do in, in the global financial crisis? It crashed. Yes. And how did it do in the 1970s when we had declines of the equity markets? Actually, silver went up. And the reason for that is because we were in a stagflationary environment, which I think it's much more likely than what we saw back in 08 in other periods. And so that's why I, I, I emphasize that period a lot more from a behavior of assets uh, perspective. Regarding gold's historical role in bolstering central bank reserves, Tavi Costa mentions a marked shift in their strategy towards increased gold acquisitions. He predicts this trend will gain traction globally, especially amidst uncertainties surrounding traditional financial instruments such as treasuries and government bonds. More than four in five respondents expect reserve managers to increase global holdings of bullion, the highest proportion on record since the annual survey began, the World Gold Council's report said. Overall, the total quantity of gold held in national central bank reserves has increased by 17% by weight since the spring of 2004, and it has jumped six-fold in U.S. dollar value to $2.2 trillion led by Russia, China, India, and Turkey. In the discussion on monetary assets, Costa emphasizes the growing importance of gold, distinguishing its historical role from the speculative nature often associated with Bitcoin. Let's get back to the interview. No, I mean, this is an important aspect. Isn't it remarkable, the fact that we have to go above and beyond to uh, state the, 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 uh, the thesis to purchase or accumulate the metal today, uh, given where society is? And, and I, I, you know, this was a, a slight, you know, indirect shot at Bitcoin. Not, not gonna lie. This and the reason for it is because I think that a lot of the the, the Bitcoin community, uh, which I have nothing against. In fact, I have no issues with Bitcoin. But I also think that what those folks don't appreciate is something called history, and the centuries that we've had of gold being the monetary metal and being a monetary alternative to enhance the quality of central banks' reserves is something that I think it's understated in today's environment. And the fact that we're seeing that shift of accumulation of gold coming from central banks being more pronounced than the prior decades is something that I think just reinforces that opinion. And I think we're just at the beginning. I think those central banks, they're not here for a 15, 20% movement in the gold price. They're really here because of the risk of their own monetary systems, given the fact that inflation will probably be here uh, for a much longer period of time, particularly across developed economies. And if that's the case, when you have inflation in developed economies, the first thing you have is the uh, instability of their monetary system, which is something we've been starting to see across many places that used to be seen as the safe havens. I'll give an example. The Japanese yen used to be a safe haven not too long ago. It was the safest currency on the planet, completely collapsed. And so those economies have not disclosed major purchases of gold yet. Majority of the purchases that we've seen are coming from emerging markets, particularly China and the Eastern societies to be uh, to be even more uh, defined on those, those uh, jurisdictions that are coming. And so I think that this is going to be a phenomenon that will spread across other global central banks. And uh, ultimately, this is the only alternative those central banks really have that actually carries this long-term stability and long-term history and really long-term history, not a decade, not two decades. We're talking centuries of serving as, as real money and also improving the quality of their balance sheet assets. And so... No, this makes me bullish because ultimately what central banks do is what 60, 40 portfolios in large institutions, pension funds tend to do as well. And if you look back in the 80s or so, um, when central banks have started to sell, not sell their metal, but really started to buy treasuries, we saw gold actually collapsing value during that period. We actually saw an accumulation of sovereign debt like we've never seen before. Seeing central banks, and that, that was actually the creation of the 60-40 idea, the risk parity idea, the reasoning for behind having a large allocation of fixed income in your portfolio. Now we're on the back of the other side of this, where these large institutions are changing their tune. They're starting to buy gold. Still, when you look at those other more less uh, government related institutions, and I'm referring to pension funds that are uh, actually driven by private markets, 
uh, they have yet to change their opinions about gold and their allocation of assets. And I think we're going to see a shift, a migration of capital back to real assets. And gold would be a big, uh, you know, an attractive, uh, uh, you know, alternative uh, for those uh, folks that are looking for a defensive asset uh, that actually have or carries uh, less volatility than treasuries for the first time in 45 years. Silver briefly broke above the upper boundary of its descending channel on June 20th signaling a potential weakening of the channel's resistance. This brief breach adds a modestly bullish perspective to the charts. A significant breakout earlier this year could lead to a surge to $35 for silver. However, we need to see a bullish reversal in the short term before aiming for these longer-term targets. In the face of recent economic shifts, are you considering adding silver and gold to your investment portfolio as a hedge against potential market volatility? Drop your thoughts in the comment section below. If you find this video informative, don't forget to support our channel and turn on notifications to stay informed about our latest videos. See you in the next video.